Uh, my name is Professor Tom Solomon. I'm the Director of the Institute of Infection and Global Health at the University of Liverpool. And I'm actually a neurologist by clinical training and I work at the Walton Neurocentre in Liverpool. And additionally, I'm the Director of the NIHR Health Protection Research Unit in Emerging and Zoonotic Infections. Our group in Liverpool has been studying flaviviruses, which is Zika is a flavivirus, for uh, more than 20 years. And some of the most important ones in the past have been, and indeed still are, Japanese encephalitis virus, dengue virus, West Nile virus. So Zika is a virus in the same family, and all of these viruses cause neurological damage, either by directly getting into the nervous system and destroying neurons, or by the immune response, the body's protection of itself. The term neurotropic viruses is to describe viruses that get into the nervous system and cause damage to neurons. Zika is really interesting because it seems to be damaging both the central nervous system, causing things like encephalitis when it gets into the brain, and also the peripheral nervous system when it damages the peripheral nerves. And so with Zika, with Zika there have been now some careful case control studies that are showing that there is an association. But one of the challenges is that interpreting the responses, the antibody responses, for any flavivirus are difficult if there's more than one virus circulating or that has circulated in the past at the same time. And so um, what this means is you need very careful tests to distinguish between which is actually the causal agent now. So the published data so far have shown that patients with Guillain-Barre have been infected with Zika, but they've also been infected with dengue sometime in the recent past. And one of the things we're trying to do is to tease out, uh, to be sure it is Zika that's causing the problem this time. And also to see perhaps is there something about the relationship where you've had a dengue infection and then a Zika infection, which maybe puts you at increased risk of some of these strange neurological diseases. In terms of treatment, at the moment we're treating Guillain-Barre syndrome caused by Zika just the same as we do for other forms of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is with intravenous immunoglobulin or with plasma exchange, which means we try and take the antibodies or the damaging uh, proteins out of the blood. Uh, that seems to be helping with Zika, but clearly if the virus itself is causing some of the damage, then that may lead us to, to think again. And in fact, we've recently published for Japanese encephalitis virus a small randomised control trial of intravenous immunoglobulin versus placebo to see what difference it has in these kind of infections. For, for Japanese encephalitis virus, the immunoglobulin contains antibody against the virus because it's uh, obtained by, from the blood of people who've been infected previously. So it has antiviral properties and anti-inflammatory properties. At the moment, the intravenous immunoglobulin that we give for Zika is just working because of its anti-inflammatory properties because Zika's not been around enough for, for long enough for people to contain, give antibodies when they give blood. So the term emerging infections is used quite a lot and it has been for decades. And Every time something happens, we seem to be caught out by surprise. But increasingly now, I think we just have to accept that this is the state of the world that we live in. We shouldn't be surprised by an emerging infection. It shouldn't be considered as new. We just have to be ready for the next thing that's coming. We had SARS, we had influenza, we had Ebola, now we've got Zika. And I think we need to adapt the way we, we respond to these things so that we have a, a permanent state of readiness to, to deal with these situations as soon as they arise. And I think there's certainly a feeling among the community now, the scientific community, that we are much quicker at reacting and we're also much better at reacting together as a community. So you try and minimise the duplication, we try and have people focusing on their particular expertise and then sharing everything they're doing to, to the benefit of everyone that's interested. With some, with some foresight, the British government put some research money into emerging infections. They funded a, a National Institute for Health Research, Health Protection Research Unit in Emerging and Zoonotic Infections. And that gave us in Liverpool funding to get started on Ebola when that was a problem and it effectively acted like seed funding. Mm -hmm. The same's happened with Zika, so we've been able to very quickly get research going in South America with colleagues there. And uh, this has been supplemented by funding from the MRC and the Wellcome Trust, 
as well as the Newton Fund. And what this means is that we're actually in a position to much more quickly get on top of, of some of these problems and some of these some unanswered questions. We are very digitally connected. No one ever sleeps anymore. Uh, it's a 24-hour society. Um, and also, yeah, there's much easier ways of sharing things on, on web platforms, etc. We have our study that we're doing on, on neurological disease caused by Zika uh, is, is multi-platform. Uh, doctors can fill in old-fashioned case record forms with a pen if they still own a pen. Uh, they can enter data online on the computer. They'll be able to enter it just with their iPhone and an app. So it, it means that everything is being uploaded in real time, which then means you can anal analyze the data quickly. Everything we do is pushed out there as soon as possible. We get some really interesting, my Twitter handle is at runningmadprof, and I get some really interesting tweets from people asking specific questions. They've seen something, they've heard something. And so you get a very good dialogue and a very quick dialogue, and, and, and it's a very exciting time to be operating in this kind of science.